Now, are you one of those people who always stops to pat a dog in the street? Do you love the sound of a purring cat on your lap? What is it about animals that puts us at ease? And how are our furry friends changing cognitive therapy? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Assistance animals have been around for decades. In the UK, the first guide dogs stepped out with their owners back in the 1930s. Now they're providing therapy for a wide range of people. But are we making the most of this bond with animals? And should animal-assisted therapy become a wider part of healthcare? Domestic animals play a big part in our lives, both as pets and as valuable contributors to the workforce. But our emotional connection to them is also changing our approach to cognitive therapy, our animals key to our health and well-being. The relationship between humans and animals stretches back to the agricultural revolution. But since then, domesticated animals have also become more than just commodities. Today we keep some as pets, based purely on the emotional reward they give us. The pet industry in the US alone is worth over $70 billion a year. Medical professionals too are increasingly using our favourite animals to assist with the treatment of mental and physical disorders. How important is the power of animal companionship and how can it influence us psychologically? Famed psychologist Sigmund Freud introduced his own dog to therapy sessions in the 1930s. Today, a number of animals are used in a variety of ways to help treat physical and mental disorders. In Ukraine, dolphins help former soldiers with the after-effects of war. Elsewhere, dogs help children with special needs. And four-legged visitors to hospitals are becoming increasingly popular, despite one-time concerns over hygiene. There's a lot of evidence that shows that animals have a relaxing effect on people, adults and children alike, and that creates positive affect. And we know now that there's a strong connection between the mind and the body. Recent studies suggest animal therapy breaks down barriers between patients and therapists, as animals provide a non-judgmental pair of ears and a calming influence. Is it an idea that should be developed more in a medical setting? The practice already has vastly grown over the last 10 years, even though research on its effectiveness is still largely inconclusive. Pets have provided happiness in homes for centuries. The mere touch of a cat or dog can lower blood pressure and lift our mood. Will we see more animals playing a part in our health care in the future? Let me introduce today's guests. Joining us via Skype from Melbourne, Australia, is Melanie Jones, psychologist, trainer and director of Lead the Way. Here at the roundtable, we have Amanda Cheesley, Royal College of Nursing, professional lead for long-term conditions and end-of-life care. Sarah Gordon, special needs teacher and certified professional practitioner of animal-assisted play therapy. And we also have Frank, a fully trained therapy dog with us here in the studio. Uh, Sarah, tell us a bit about Frank. What do you do with him? What does he do? Uh, Frank is a therapy dog um, and we provide animal assisted therapy, um, which is a form of therapy for children and adults who have social, emotional, mental health needs. Um, we uh, create plans to achieve their personal goals and um, he, he really enjoys the work he does. He gets to play games every day. He uh, does see, he seems, he's very calm. He's quite stoic. He's been sitting in the studio for, oh, for a while yeah. now. He, he's a very, very calm dog. He's a Newfoundland breed, which is uh, known for their patience and their calmness around children. Um, and uh, it, it, he is quite a character. When I bring in a 10 stone dog to meet any child or adult, um, their faces light up and they can't wait to interact with him and, and spend some time with him. So how does he help children with autism? Because one of the issues with, on the autistic spectrum is sometimes a lack of ability to, to connect yes. with the outside world. So how 
how does Frank help? So we work with the um, personal goals of individual clients. So although a client may be autistic, we work with their personal goals, some of which you're right, is to connect to the outside world. With Frank, we um, use lots and lots of different interventions to help them do that. One, for example, is a look game that we use and it's just instructing Frank to look in our eyes and we always use hand gestures in case the client is non-verbal. Look into their eyes and if he holds eye contact for a few seconds he gets a treat. And so we repeat this game and um, so they, they form a connection that way. They also form a connection through stroking, through games and they just end up falling in love with him and uh, these skills are then brought out into their the classroom environment and their home environment and we have found that children are becoming more communicative with their parents and their um, peers around them after interacting with Frank. Uh, Amanda is this something that the health service is, is is aware of, is, is looking more at? It, it is looking more at it and I think there's been massive steps in the last couple of years in terms of moving from just uh, pets who come into, the, into health environments just to be stroked by people for example in care homes for old people to actually recognising the value that having a trained animal, particularly a dog, um, can have for people who have mental illness, who have personality disorders who have autism but also for people with physical disabilities who may be struggling with therapy and again there are there are a number of places that are using dogs and horses actually for for mm -hmm. people and if you think about things like riding for the disabled there have been a lot of work with people with balance issues and right. also with mental health issues who have access riding for the disabled over the years so going back to your question about the hospitals or healthcare settings I think it is recognized but obviously in a hospital particularly there are certain safeguards that people would want to put in place to avoid people worrying about any sort of risk to patients. Well, I was going to say, I mean, one of, one of the things that hospitals uh, are, are, are very um, uptight about is, is the possibility of bringing germs into Indeed, hospital. there are obviously S certain sensible common sense things that need to be put in place so if the dog or their owner handler has been unwell they shouldn't go into the hospital mm -hmm. the um, dog should not have had contact with any sort of um, bug recently they should have all of their inoculations up to date they should we recommend as the RCN in our protocol and it isn't law by any manner of means that they shouldn't be fed on raw meat if they're visiting in a hospital mm. but that isn't a, a, a total requirement but the the number of infections that a dog can carry are fairly few that would pass right. to a human um, yeah. and and therefore if the right safeguards are put in place the risks are minimal and there's no reason why why work with animals can't continue. not at all no uh, Melanie, uh, it, it, we know that, that dogs have assisted with a number of physical difficulties in the past. Um, uh, people who, who are blind, people who are deaf, um, dogs are very useful, very trainable in those kind of situations. But now we're seeing them being used more in the field of, of mental health, aren't we? Absolutely. So the dogs that we work with, um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. <laughs> Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll try uh, and sort that out for you. Uh, but in terms of mental health, what, what kind of areas can, can dogs help with? So what we see mostly is what we would call a priming effect, which is where people are producing higher levels of oxytocin, which is the feel-good or connection hormone. And what that does is it turns down the body's stress response system. So people, that, that's where you're seeing the reduced heart rates and the lowered blood pressure. Effectively, what that's doing is it's turning the environment into a calm and soothing environment. So people feel engaged, they feel connected. And so what that does is it opens the door to be able to deal with a lot of the difficult topics that we might be wanting to cover in therapy. So it brings down stress levels and, and that has been documented, yes. hasn't it? You stroke a dog or a cat and your, your yes. stress, stress levels reduce. Do we know yeah. about long-term effects though, long-term benefits? 
No, there's not great studies. Um, and I think that's um, one of the things that we need to do more in, and certainly that's where our research is going. We're looking at taking, uh, I guess, a short-term immediate view of what the dog's doing in therapy. And then we're looking at the medium term benefits, which is the skill building that we just heard about before. So specific things like being able to look. And we're also looking at the longer term benefits. So if we're seeing some physiological shifts for people, and we're seeing them develop skills, perhaps what we're doing there in terms of neuroplasticity is allowing the brain to rewire in more healthy ways. And so perhaps we're, we're repairing trauma, or perhaps we're repairing the attachment system. And that's where we're trying to go long term in terms of our therapeutic input. Amanda, is this something that would help with, um, I mean, we talked about lowering stress, what about PTSD and, and trauma? Uh, there is some suggestion that, that animals can help in areas where disasters have happened, um, for example, you know, hurricanes. Yeah. Or, uh, it, 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 does that work? I mean, do, can for animals some, for bridge some a gap? People, absolutely. And I think, I think one has to recognise that, it, uh, that, that for some people it won't work um, because they don't have that sort of connection or don't like a dog or it isn't culturally their particular um, something which would be acceptable to them but I think for for many people and particularly with post-traumatic stress disorder I think there is a recognition that having a purpose in order to you've got to get up you've got to feed your animal you've got to take it out for a walk mm. you've got to look after it it gives you a different focus and that can help reduce the stress and and also by stroking or by doing an activity with your dog or whatever it is that the therapy animal is that can actually make a significant difference and i think that um certainly the help the heroes have been looking at the use of dogs for soldiers or f military personnel yes. who are who are experiencing post-traumatic stress uh, and and does that seem to be it seems to be effect? having a very positive effect but i think often that then progresses into somebody having a dog of their own as opposed to as as sarah's doing going in and with with frank um with with children and then coming out again yeah. it might go on to actually them having an animal of their own who can continue to progress their 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 sort of a recovery really uh, you you were saying that that frank is trained so he's yes. not just a dog you've picked up and, and yeah. walked in how is he trained what is he trained he to do? he is um trained in general obedience um i am certified with dr van fleet from the international institute of animal assisted play therapists and she very much believes that we should keep the dog's personality, their quirks, because we can use these as metaphors in a the therapy session. So his training is basic. It is more about the temperament of the dog rather than what they can do, what um, rosettes they've won. It's, it's more about how they interact with people around so them. So I, I presume he's got to be quite calm. His calmness is key. Playfulness is also key. Um, and uh, general wants to be around people. Um, some dogs are naturally a bit quieter than others and may withdraw, whereas your um, crew have found out today Frank's not one of those dogs. Frank is dogs. definitely not a withdrawing dogs, no, dog. No, he, he will say hello to everyone. He loves people and that, that is imperative. And his needs are also always, always considered within yeah, I was going to the ask therapy, about this yeah. because I suppose Frank meeting, he meets lots and lots of different yeah. people and he's taken into lots of different environments. He's in a TV studio today. Yeah. Um, does he ever get stressed? Um, Frank is so calm that I have never seen him react in an uh, extremely stressful manner. Maybe he will do um, a yawn, which is a stress signal. And I always watch out for these stress signals. And also, I, I inform the client about these stress signals. So the client learns to read the dog as well as I do. And when Frank withdraws from a training activity, I'll ask the client, why, why do you think Frank's gone away? We know it's because he doesn't uh, not want to be with you, because he likes you, but why do you think he's done that? And they can uh, identify he's tired and he needs a break. Uh, Melanie, is it always a furry animal, a dog, a cat? You mentioned a horse. Um, we've heard about dolphins, haven't we? But presumably it's got to be an animal that can form a connection with a human. A, a goldfish isn't going to yeah. cut it. Uh, um, 
I guess a goldfish probably isn't going to cut it. <laughs> but <laughs> what we expect is that if it's an animal that somebody likes and feels connected to, then yes, we're probably going to see those kinds of benefits. Uh, and so, you know, do dogs particularly, I'll speak about dogs because I have most of my clinical experience working with dogs. But dogs are amazing at teaching us life skills, at, you know, helping us to live mindfully. Um, as Sarah was saying about Frank, you know, occasionally you might see a yawn from him. But when we teach our clients about those signals, whether it's working with our therapy dogs or working with their own dogs, what they can start to do is reflect on their own state and what is it in their behaviour or their actions or their emotional state that the dog may be responding to or are they just tired uh, the kinds of things that dogs need like rest and play and a drink of water are all the kinds of things that we as people need as well. So we can really learn a lot and there's a lot of crossover between what our clients need and what animals need. We were talking about how uh, animals are quite empathetic to the needs yeah. of, of, of humans. Does it require yeah. a lot of training, a, a lot of expenditure to get an animal to the point where it is able to make a difference to uh, to one of your patients? Yes and no. I think it comes down to, as Sarah was saying, being able to read the dog's intentions and read the dog's signals. So all dogs will respond naturally to the state of people around them, but they may respond in different ways. So we have some dogs who are approach dogs so they will um, approach someone who is distressed, crying, making unusual sounds. And we have withdraw dogs, dogs who are uncomfortable in the presence of those sounds and may step backwards. And both of those reactions are valid and important. But the, I guess the thing is that the handler needs to read those instinctive and natural signals. And so it's really the handler's skill in reading and interpreting that is the most important part. Amanda, from a uh, from a scientific point of view, we've we've had studies that show uh, interacting with dogs uh, um, or any pets uh, can lower your stress levels, can lower your blood pressure. Uh, the American Heart Association is saying that owning an animal could stave off the risk Risks. or reduce yep. the risk of a heart attack. Um, should there be more? studies into the benefits? Oh absolutely and I think that, um, that Australia and America particularly are well ahead of us here in the UK in terms of um, undertaking some fairly robust studies about the benefits both mental and physical benefits of the use of animal assisted interventions and the the other element of that is we don't have very much we don't have anywhere that people can do that training it's in the where Sarah did hers is one of the only places in this country right. and most people end up going to do their training in America which mm. is really costly and in order to get the certification Why is to the do UK that. behind America and Australia? I, th I, think we've, I think we've lagged behind because we haven't recognised the benefit and then there has always been or for a very long time here we've had sort of um, pat therapy dogs so just visiting dogs who go in that people can stroke rather than them actually being part of somebody's clinical Someone, yeah, treatment plan, if therapy, you like, or yeah. therapy. And I think there is now a recognition that we need to be doing more, and I think that there will definitely be more studies. Also, the studies into where there were any risks, because I, th I think there is quite reasonable anxiety about the risks, but they sometimes have been blown out of all proportion. How do the kids react when they see Frank? Um, we have mixed reactions, somewhat they can't wait to get in and stroke him and interact with him. Other children we've had to do soft starts with because they can only look through a window at Frank. So we um, do an act, a proximity activity together whereby the client is in control of how close they get to Frank. We have a stepping stone activity and I, I'm pleased to say all, all the children and some of the adults that I've worked with, they they will they all sit down and stroke Frank, however phobic they were to begin with, because it's carefully managed. Do you see a quantifiable difference? Do, do, do parents say to you, I have seen an improvement? We've had some real success stories. Um, one, one of them was a, an adopted child. He didn't have autism, he was just adopted and um, couldn't 
faced their past, discussed their past, um, came in for some sessions with Frank and I made this child aware that Frank was adopted because he, he wasn't from me. Um, I had to adopt him from Wales and he had another family and I showed this child um, Frank's family tree and she um, was able to say that I'm adopted too, I'm like Frank too. And we did a family tree of her own and she um, was also able to identify how lucky she was that she got adopted by her parents um, and it enhanced their relationship and it actually brought a tear to, to their parents eye. Um, it's, she, it's, a, it's a very emotional story. And it, it's, it's using the dog as a metaphor is um, a, a really great way to um, help clients. Um, but I, I do think, although that there is, is a need for the dog to be trained, of course, um, the handler is also trained like I am in um, dog stress signals and communication. But I also have a background in special needs teaching and I have um, a play therapy um, certification and a counselling certification. So as a standalone myself, I can uh, provide an input and Frank, you know, really, really... Um, so well, he's, so he's your assistant, yeah, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he, he really um, encourages... Um, the children to open up and to share things. It that seems they like you know, he he is he he is the buffer in in the relationship and and, and smooths over helping yeah. children to yeah. talk about. And I guess this is this is what you see in clinics, maybe with elderly people. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just about loneliness; it's about reaching out and, and and interacting. It is, and I think it's about it's about something that brings a sense of normality into some people's lives. I mean, if you've been in an institution, whatever that might be, for any length of time, your sense of the world outside, if you like, is very much shrunk. And, and there are lots of lovely stories about people who perhaps have had dementia or people who have been unable to speak, have serious communication problems. When they see an animal, it might help them to remember something that was positive in their lives before, and it makes a massive difference. You know, somebody smiling and feeling happy when they've never shown any sign of that before is wonderful for them and for anybody who, who is close to them. I think it's astonishing. We, we as humans have a, a very odd relationship with animals. Sometimes we're not very nice to them. And then mm. there are stories like this where they are, are clearly are of, of huge benefit. Um, Melanie, do you think we're going to see more of this in future? Do you think that there will be a, a much more uh, a move towards using animals more in healthcare? Absolutely. So uh, for our institute, for example, 10 years ago, we graduated 10, 20 handler and dog teams a year. And this year, we'll expect to graduate 80 already. Uh, so it's growing exponentially. There's more and more interest in the research. There's more and more push for high quality research. And there's more and more push for clinical programs, uh, such as Dr. Van Fleet's program, where people can actually learn the skills to conduct interventions and not, not um, just those visiting settings that we've had for so many years. Yeah, I think there's a difference between uh, emotional support animals and these kind of uh, animals that we're talking about. Yes. Uh, what interventions do you find, have you found to be most, uh, where there's been most difference with the use of, uh, of animal-assisted therapy? We particularly teach our clinicians not just to do clinician-led in intervention so it's not just all about the clinician saying okay now do this activity now do that activity we're also really focused on animal-led interventions that are spontaneous where the dog reacts instinctively to what's happening with the client and we also do interventions that are client-led where clients can explore issues and outcomes and and find their own meanings it's clear that there is a huge difference being made yes does frank enjoy it <laughs> He does enjoy it. Um, every time I, I put my uniform on and get my treat pouch ready to go, his tail's wagging, his pacing, he can't wait to get in the van and, and go to the next school or client's house we're going to. And actually during the session, it's all, it's all fun and games. I think that's a really good thing with our interventions. The client 
doesn't really know that they're participating in therapy. They're, they're playing with a dog and it, it's very subtle what they're, they're achieving. Well, what they're achieving, sorry, it is huge, but how I go about it is very subtle. And, uh, and do you think Frank know, understands or, or, or knows or, or senses that what he's doing is helping? He definitely senses the needs of the client. Um, we were in a school just the other day, a child came in, uh, first time meeting Frank, we, we'd, we'd done all the preparation, but the child was, was not present. They came in staring at the ceiling and looking at toys and I was in the back of the room. Frank was off the lead and before I could jump in and say hello, Frank slowly went up to this child, licked him and his face up. He smiled and he joined us in the classroom in the session. He was present and um, that that's Frank. That's all Frank. Well, it's been lovely having Frank in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for bringing him in. He's You're been welcome. lying on the floor for most of he it. Is he, is he awake? Frank, up, up. There, oh, there he, he is. is. Oh, he, he's been really well behaved. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. And thank you to the rest of my guests for coming in. Great discussion. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Roundtable. Until next time, bye for now.